Welcome to Radio Who, What, Why. I'm Jeff Sheckman. There are some stories that just won't ever go away, mostly because the threads always seem to be unraveling and new information is always arriving. Pearl Harbor, 9-11, and the Kennedy assassination are the most notable contemporary examples. My guest, author and investigative journalist Mark Shaw, has for years been looking at the events and people surrounding the JFK assassination. For him, like the story itself, the layers of the onion keep getting peeled away, only to reveal another translucent layer. In his new book, The Reporter Who Knew Too Much, he brings into bold relief the story of famed journalist and TV personality Dorothy Kilgallen. Mark Shaw is the author of over 20 books. He's a former legal analyst for USA Today and CNN. He's a California attorney and investigative reporter who's dedicated the past 10 years to looking into the truth about the JFK assassination. It is my pleasure to welcome Mark Shaw to Radio Who, What, Why. Mark Shaw, thanks so much for joining us. Oh, Jeff, thank you. And if I, if I could write as well as you do, I'd have 25 bestsellers. That was just <laughs> terrific. Thank you. Uh, uh, just uh, great. And yes, I've, I've been uh, working on Dorothy's story. Well, for those that are a little younger than you and I, let's tell our listeners who Dorothy Kilgallen was. Yeah, and you know, it's amazing. We've discovered that the younger generation knows a lot about Dorothy because of all the reruns, you know, of What's My Line. But remarkable woman. Uh, I've gained such respect for her, and I'll tell you in a minute, uh, you know, uh, I never even intended to write this book. Uh, I didn't know much about Dorothy. But um, there's no media uh, person today, I don't care who it is, Diane Sawyer or or uh, Oprah or anybody who could touch Dorothy in the 50s and 60s. You know, the New York Post called her the most powerful female voice in America, and she was. Uh, I mean, you just look at these credits. She was on What's My Line, as most people remember her from that as a panelist. 25 million people watched that show every Sunday night on CBS. She had a column in a big newspaper at the time, the Journal American, in New York City, uh, her column, Voice of Broadway, syndicated to 200 newspapers across the country. And, and as you know, that was the time when people actually read the newspaper. They didn't have the Internet or television much or anything, so that was a big deal. And then an investigative reporter, wow, she covered the most uh, high-profile trials of the 20th century. Uh, uh, the Lindbergh uh, baby kidnapping case, um, the uh, Lenny Bruce uh, First Amendment case, uh, the Dr. Sam Shepard case that became uh, foundation for the Fugitive television series and then the movie with Harrison Ford, and, of course, the Jack Ruby case. And she did all that. She had a radio program in New York City with her uh, husband, uh, listened to by about a million people um, every morning for about 15 years, and she raised three kids. So, uh, you know, like I say, I don't think anybody uh, in the modern era could touch her. One of the other remarkable things about her, and I was really thinking about this in in reading your book, is that she was very prescient in so many ways in the way she combined both news and entertainment. You know, we think of that as a modern phenomenon, but essentially that's what she was doing back then. Yeah, and I think she may have been the first one to be able to do it. And, and, you know, she escaped um, with having credibility in both areas. Voice of Broadway uh, was a gossip column in some ways with talking about Broadway and show business and entertainment and all of that. So then, And then you had the What's My Line situation, and so that was entertainment as well. But the other side of her life, which I found fascinating, was this whole journalist investigative reporter area. And somehow or another, despite her being kind of uh, attached to that entertainment area, she could get away with being what I believe was the most credible uh, journalist and investigative reporter at the time. Uh, somehow or another, she did that. The respect was there. They talk about the power that she had, uh, calling her Miss New York at one time, or you're gonna uh, people who who read the book and want to go to the Dorothy Kilgallen Story dot org will see all of these videos of Dorothy Kilgallen that, we, uh, that we've that we found that never been seen before. And one of them that you'll, they'll love is her at the uh, Dr. Sam Shepard case. And she's standing uh, amongst, oh, probably 15 to 20 reporters, all just scattered around her, focused on Dorothy as the celebrity there, but also the most credible reporter at the trial. So she somehow or another got away with that and had the respect of those people whether it had to do with entertainment or news. 
One of the things about the Shepard case, which really brought her to even greater prominence, is not only did she cover the story, she impacted the outcome of the story. Yeah, yeah, that's the that's the power, Jeff, that she had. Um, Effley Bailey, who I was privileged to work with on a on a particular case at one point, uh, you know, he he couldn't believe what kind of power she had because. The way it works, she she covered that trial. Uh, people may remember the doctor, uh, Sam Shepard case, charged the doctor was with killing his pregnant wife. And then we had the whole one-armed man situation and all of that. Well, they had a trial. Dorothy was there. And they convicted him. And her headlines were verdict is shocking. I mean, she just didn't buy it all. But she was very careful with revealing sources. That's another bit of respect for her that I have. And she knew something about that case that she couldn't tell anybody until the judge was dead. And when he was, she approached F. Lee Bailey and she said, Lee, I want you to know that I went to that trial. The judge asked me co- to come into chambers to get an autograph. And he said, what, what are you doing? Paraphrasing, what are you doing here? And she said, well, this case has all the you know, uh, elements uh, that you want. I mean, a famous, you know, a doctor and, and the, the murder and, and, you know, all of these things with who got in the house and did all this. And, and he looked at her and he said, well, I don't know what you're talking about. He's guilty as hell. And so you have a bias on the judge, but she kept that secret until uh, that judge died. She told Bailey, Bailey put it into the petition for a reversal of the verdict with the Supreme Court the verdict was reversed um, on trial. He was found not on retrial. He was found not guilty. And Lee Bailey uh, basically says, hey, Dorothy Kilgallen's the reason that Dr. Sam Shepard's case was reversed. How did she get interested in pursuing the Kennedy assassination? Well, I'll tell you what uh, I want to say is that me as I've written two books that, that have something to do with the JFK assassinations. You know, I've talked to you about them both. There are all these other books out there, Vincent Bugliosi and Gerald Posner and book after book after book. All of us miss this. Um, You know, we should have uh, figured this out, and I'll tell you in a minute how I landed on the case. But um, the whole thing with with her getting into the JFK assassination was personal, not business. And the reason it was is because JFK, she knew him as a senator. He was to her house. Uh, you know, She had this huge, lavish mansion on East 80, uh, 68th Street. He was a guest there, but the, the, what really made it personal was that when she went to the White House with her youngest son, Carrie, and um, Pierre Salinger set up the tour, JFK came into the library, and he was so kind to little Carrie, looking at some letters he'd brought from his third gla- grade uh, classmates, one letter that he had, he gave her a uh, she uh, JFK gave uh, Carrie a PT 109 pin for his lapel, and so uh, you know that was just such a big deal to her. And so when JFK died, she took it personally, and she started looking into the case. And as she as she said, and I wrote in the book, um, you know the person that I remember is this tall man, um, you know, looking down on a little third grader talking about uh, the letters that he had brought with him. That is the man who was assassinated in Dallas. And so that launched an 18-month investigation by Kilgallen into the JFK assassination that continued on until the day she died. Talk a little bit about her death and how she was found. Okay, um, let's just go back just for a second, if you don't mind, because I think it's interesting as to, as to what happened here, uh, how I got on the trail of this, uh, of this uh, case with Dorothy. Uh, I had written Melvin Belli, King of the Courtroom, about the famous uh, San Francisco lawyer who represented Ruby, and I had some real reservations about his representation of Ruby. So that was a biography. Then I took that because I learned of Belli's affinity for the mafia, and I traced that back in a book called The Poison Patriarch all the way back to Joe Kennedy and his double cross of the mafia. Well, while I was interviewing uh, a doctor in the um, working on the uh, Melvin Belli book, he said to me, well, you know, he knew Dorothy Kilgallen. And I said, you mean the what's my line woman? He said, no, Mark. He said, you don't know a lot about her. She was a great, uh, celebrated, uh, Pulitzer Prize nominated journalist and investigative reporter, and they met at the Ruby trial. And I said, what? He said, yeah. And he said, you know, something you probably ought to know, uh, right after uh, Dorothy died, Mel, he called him Mel, Mel said to me, they've killed Dorothy. Now they'll go after Ruby. And that was what 
quote, I couldn't get out of my mind. I was going to quit with the two books, and I couldn't get this out of my mind. Through some real serendipity, I landed onto some never-before-seen never videos that I say can be seen on the Dorothy Kilgallen story.org, and that launched my investigation of her investigation of the JFK assassination all the way up until she died. And here's what we know. We know that she was at the Ruby trial and the only uh, journalist to interview Jack Ruby. Uh, we know that she exposed his Warren Commission testimony uh, before it was supposed to be released. Uh, we know that she was continuing her investigation and w had made one trip to New Orleans where a mafia don named Carlos Marcello was that she suspected of being involved in JFK's death. We know that. We know that she planned a next trip to New Orleans. And then we know that she was found dead in her apartment or her townhouse in New York City. Uh, and I have so many primary sources in this book, and one of them is the hairdresser who was closest to Kilgallen, one of her best friends, who will tell you that she feared for her life and for her family. The other hairdresser, Simpson, uh, Charles Simpson, said that uh, Kilgallen told him, if um, the wrong people knew what I know now, it would cost me my life. She obviously was scared. Sinclair will say that she bought a gun, changed her will. She was obviously very frightened of those people who were worried about a book that she was writing for Random House, exposing the people involved in the assassination. So Sinclair, in this video that will chill people when they, when they watch it, says that he arrived about 9 o'clock in the morning at her townhouse, went up to where he thought she would be in a, in a kind of dressing room place where he did her hair and makeup and things like that, and she wasn't there, and he walks into another room, and he finds her body. And he will tell readers that um, it was in, she was sleeping in the wrong – she never slept in that bedroom. She uh, never slept in that bed. She was wearing her makeup, eyelashes, and a hairpiece that he had um, worked on the night before when she had her final What's My Line column. A book that she was supposed to be reading was upside down. It kind of looked like it had just been moved there and basically saying it was staged death scene. So that's how Dorothy Kilgallen died. That's how he found her. And then, of course, I can get into what happened uh, thereafter. One of the other aspects of this is that the papers that she was working on, all of her information, all of the work that she was doing, really was never found. Pretty thick file, and I describe what was in it, documents, interviews, all that kind of thing. You know, she had the best sources in the world because of, of her powerful... Um, you know, appearance to people and all of that. And so people trusted her with things. So it was a pretty thick file. She kept it by, uh, by her side or in, uh, under lock and key. Um, and that, uh, that file uh, disappeared and has never been seen today. Now, I have a belief uh, that it's still out there somewhere, perhaps, that it may happen. And as you know, uh, I feel so strongly about an investigation that should happen here that I've sent a letter along with all of my evidence to the New York uh, District Attorney uh, requesting that they launch an investigation of uh, Kilgallen's death. And one of the things I hope that will come out of that, Jeff, is that we'll find that file. What do we know about this mystery man that she was allegedly with right after the What's My Line show that night? Yeah, people have read the, read the book, and, and I guess I'm going to blow my horn a little bit. They're, they're now in the third printing. You can't even get it on Amazon. It's going to take a few days to get it. So people have really gotten wrapped up in this. And I think one of the reasons is because I set it up as a true crime whodunit murder mystery. And I name the suspects in there. I name what, what's involved with motive and who may have wanted to kill, uh, kill Kilgallen for, for this uh, investigation she was doing. And, and all of that, and th one of those suspects is a guy. Uh, we can trace her steps the last night of her life, November 7th. Um, Sinclair got her ready for What's My Line. She appeared on that show. If you watch it, uh, she was sharp as could be. And there was one contestant on there named Catherine Stone from Tennessee. And uh, when the, during the show, Kilgallen guessed that woman, Catherine Stone's uh, occupation, as selling dynamite. After the show, uh, they invited the contestants, along with Dorothy and anybody else who wanted to come to the Regency Hotel. And when Catherine got there, and this is another of those videotaped interviews that I, they have on there with Sinclair, uh, Simpson, Joe Tonahill, the co-counsel co for Ruby, and Catherine Stone, who will tell readers, listen, I, I saw her in a back booth, 
She was with a guy. Uh, they were very close together. There was no laughing. They were having some drinks. It was a very serious conversation. Well, I was able to track down the fact that this uh, mystery man, identified in the book, uh, was a columnist from uh, Columbus, Ohio, and he and Kilgallen had a romance, and she then suspected him of leaking her JFK uh, assassination investigation information uh, to people who they, they shouldn't have heard what was going on there. And so uh, I have interviewed that man three times. He had some other interview. There are very much inconsistencies in those interviews that make me believe that he's a suspect, and I've let the um, uh, New York uh, District Attorney know about him and where they can find him. Hoping, hopefully they'll talk to him. But there's really two uh, really incriminating uh, pieces of evidence, and there are two poems that he wrote. And one is about uh, a person at the typewriter um, who is, um, you know, muzzled and, and can't, uh, can't uh, write any more words. The other one is even more uh, incredible, and it's all about, it, it, it comes with a, uh, an image of a bartender uh, fixing drinks. And it talks about the fact that uh, poison could be put in one of those drinks. And, of course, one of the theories that I promote in the book is that Kilgallen did not die accidentally of one barbiturate, but three barbiturates in her system, and that there's no question in my mind that either at the Regency Hotel or at her townhouse, uh, these barbiturates were um, uh, somehow or another spiked into a drink that she was drinking, and that's how she died. All of which raises the question of the autopsy that followed her death and the way that mm -hmm. was handled. Yeah, it does. And, you know, people may wonder, why, why is this case important today? I mean, it's 50 years ago. I would say, you know, and I think the book proves this was murder. And murder is, you know, murder is murder five days ago or five months or five years or 50 years ago. And with a suspect out there, that's really important. And they're going to find out that basically this case was just covered up, not once but twice. Uh, first, the medical examiner was called from the Brooklyn Bureau, not the Manhattan Bureau. And that uh, have eyewitnesses in that bureau who are still alive who told me that it was mafia control, that uh, particular Brooklyn um, uh, bureau. And the autopsy was performed very quickly, which was unusual. And when I got a copy of it from the National Archives, I noticed that, yes, uh, the appearance of secanol, which people will know as sleeping pills, was evident in her system. And that's what he used when he said that she died of a combination of barbiturates and alcohol. Of course, he put in there something that should have been a clue to everybody because he wrote circumstances undetermined. But I noticed in the writing below secanol, he had written tulanol. And tulanol is kind of a jump up in danger with regard to, to something having to do with secanol. And he never mentioned that to anybody, never released it to the public, so there was a bit of a cover-up right there. And then three years later, Jeff, two toxicologists in the Brooklyn uh, office, one of them had kept the bodily fluids that they needed to re-examine them when the technology was better, and they found three barbiturates in her system, including phenobarbital. Well, obviously, that's not conducive to accidental overdose or suicide or anything else, but they did not reveal those uh, those new tests, and I'm hard on them in the book for doing that because that's basically a crime. But then I learned from the one toxicologist's uh, wife who's interviewed uh, and, and spoke in the book uh, that they were scared to death because that bureau was mafia-controlled and they didn't speak up. So, uh, in fact, the one toxicologist uh, told um, his wife Kilgallen was bumped off. So I, I believe all that together really provides the foundation for a, a, an investigation now to really look into Dorothy's case. It was also an effort that was made after her death really to paint her as a possible drug abuser and an alcoholic and use that as the reason for, the, for her death. Talk about that. Well, this is what we do today, uh, and, and it's 50 years later, but they did it then too. When, when somebody is suspected of something or in this situation is found dead like that, and the immediate outcry from the, from the medical examiner is that, you know, she was a druggie and an alcoholic, tarnishing a reputation that just concerns me still, um, we want to think the worst. We want to believe that right away instead of just saying, hey, let's stop and think about this. 
because there was no evidence at all in her life that she was a druggie or an alcoholic. You watch that last program, she's sharp as can be. Sinclair and Simpson will talk about the days before her death and how sharp she was, how great she looked, all of that. Joe Tonahill, the co-counsel for Ruby in the in the videos, will say he was with her a few months before she died and she was sharp as could be. But it's just tragic. Her family let her down, the journalists let her down, her What's My Line people let her down, and the authorities let her down. They just kind of bought that like they bought the crazy Oswald alone theory that J. Edgar Hoover was Per, you know, proposing that Kilgallen never believed. You know, it's, we just have to be careful of, of looking at things on the surface and not giving people the benefit of the doubt. And I have no, uh, no question about it, that if people had stopped and thought about this thoroughly, and, and Mark Sinclair was never interviewed, Charles Simpson was never interviewed, there was no investigation. And if they had just talked to these guys, there would have been an investigation. But Dorothy uh, Kilgallen, you know, all that's been buried for 50 years. Uh, until now, and, and I'm trying to be Dorothy's voice here. I'm trying to fight for her right to justice, which she was denied in 1965. You mentioned Hoover. What did you find in the FBI file on Kilgallen? Well, they uh, they had her under surveillance for a long time. She had written some, uh, you know, at that time, our government was kind of friendly with Fidel Castro uh, uh, off and on, and so she wrote some anti-Castro uh, columns and went to Little Miami and or little little Havana, and interviewed some uh, Cubans there, and wrote some pretty scathing columns about uh, Castro. I think that was when she was first under surveillance. But then they even went to the extent of uh, putting an informant in her circle of friends, and w- was watching what Kilgallen was doing, talking about her um, private life and her husband's private life, and all of that. But the man that she really infuriated was J. Edgar Hoover. Because, as you can imagine, seven days after the JFK assassination, she wrote a column, The Oswald File Must Not Close, and she just lambasted the Oswald alone theory. And she wrote all these columns, you know, that way. Then she was the only one to interview Jack Ruby and said that she really had questions about his, um, you know, killing of Oswald and what that meant. And then, of course, she exposed the uh, Ruby testimony before the Warren Commission before it was supposed to be released. So in one FBI file, uh, you can see that her column that she wrote, and in um, Hoover's own handwriting, it's it's written W R O N G, wrong, 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 wrong. So he certainly was an enemy, and he's one of the suspects that uh, that I uh, uh, suggest in the book because he certainly had motive to uh, eliminate Kilgallen before she wrote this book. Because if she had written it, Jeff, I think there would have been a grand jury investigation based on the evidence that she had found. The next step in her investigation was a second trip to New Orleans that she was supposed to make about a week or two after she died. Talk mm-hmm. about that. Well, again, I hope people will understand, you know, that the primary sources in the book speak to these kind of things. I just bring them to the reader and the reader can make up their own mind with regard to things. But they will see on the Dorothy Kilgallen story dot org website, they will see uh, Mark Sinclair watch him say, uh, the following about the, f- the first trip she took there. They they traveled in in separate planes, and when they got there, uh, he made he, he helped her with her hair, and then she went out, and she called him at the hotel room. They were going to have dinner, and said, go back to New York right now. Uh, get on a plane now. Uh, you know, don't tell, and don't tell anybody you were here, and don't ask me any questions about what I found here. So he went back to New York, and that happened, and then she planned this second trip. It was all set up for her to go to New Orleans, just uh, going to be just a few days or a week after she died, and I believe that they could not let her make that next trip to New Orleans because she was investigating Carlos Marcello, Ruby, Oswald, connecting them, all of that. You, you have to think about today, who would be the most ferocious reporter you know, to be getting into something like this, what kind of a, uh, any kind of a case or whatever. Well, in that day, it was Dorothy Kilgallen. And based on your reporting and your investigation, was she fearful about her life? Was she fearful that she was in danger? Well, yeah, and I think, again, you have the eyewitness testimony of Sinclair and Simpson, uh, to the fact that she was afraid for her life and her family, uh, that she had bought a gun, she changed her will, 
She was very concerned that her youngest son there, Carrie, would be kidnapped. There had been a photograph of him in Central Park by himself in one of the newspapers. Um, and But I think the most telling remark that she made was to Charles Simpson that you'll that you'll see, and that was, you know, um, if the wrong people knew what I know about the JFK assassination, it would cost me my life. And so uh, people may wonder, you know, if she was that scared, then why didn't she go to the authorities, or why didn't she get a bodyguard, or something like that? I think Dorothy Kilgallen felt that she was invincible, that she was such a big personality, such a big celebrity, that nobody could touch her. And I think um, that belief, uh, unfortunately, is what cost her her life. Mark Shaw, the book is The Reporter Who Knew Too Much, The Mysterious Death of What's My Line TV star and media icon Dorothy Kilgallen. Mark, I thank you so much for spending time with us here on Radio Who, What, Why. I'm honored to be on your show. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you for listening and joining us here on Radio Who, What, Why. I hope you join us next week for another Radio Who, What, Why podcast. I'm Jeff Sheckman. If you like this podcast, please feel free to share and help others find it by rating and reviewing it on iTunes. You can also support this podcast and all the work we do by going to whowhatwhy.org forward slash donate.